I am Jules van Binsbergen, a finance professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm Jonathan Burke, finance professor at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. Welcome back to our show. And please keep sending us your comments. We really appreciate them. It's been great doing the show. That's all I can say, Jules. I completely agree with you, Jonathan. So today we have a very exciting episode ahead of us. We're going to answer the question, can people agree to disagree about important business decisions? And the surprising answer is they can't. That is, if there's disagreement at the end of a discussion, somebody in the room is making a mistake. So to understand that better, let's take a very simple example. Can you agree to disagree about whether a number is a prime number? So just for those of us who don't know this, a prime number is a number that only has two divisors, one and itself. For example, three is a prime number. Or seven is a prime number. And the question is, can we agree to disagree about whether a number is prime? And of course, the answer is either a number is prime or it isn't. And so there's no room to disagree over this question. Right. So basically, it's very difficult to tell if a number's prime, especially if the number's large. In fact, Jules, that's the basis of the Bitcoin algorithm. The way Bitcoin works is the people that mine for new Bitcoins are actually mining for prime numbers. And what, what, it, what that means is the only way to tell if a number's prime is what we call a brute force method. You have to check every single divisor and see if it divides into the prime number. And so when we're talking about a very large prime number and we have two people that have an opinion on this, there are really only two options here. The first option is people did the brute force approach and checked whether or not the number is prime and therefore they can tell for sure whether the number is prime or not, or if they didn't run the numbers, you simply don't know. Yeah, because there's no predictability with prime numbers. That's what makes the Bitcoin algorithm work. You do not know, unless you've done the brute force algorithm, whether the number is prime. There's no predictability, there's no pattern involved. So the choice is either you don't know, or you've done the algorithm, and therefore you do know. And so when somebody says, I think that the number is prime, that statement really has no basis. Exactly. And they're making a mistake unless they've either done the algorithm or they've announced, I don't know. So in summary, two fully rational people, that is people that never make mistakes, cannot agree to disagree on this particular question. Right. And what about other questions? What about the shortest route between two places? Can people agree to disagree about that? So no, clearly not. I mean, if two people have the same information and they have access to the same maps, then either the route is the shortest route or it's not the shortest route. We cannot agree to disagree on that issue. But what about the quickest route? Can you disagree about what the quickest route is? Well, now somebody might have more information about traffic than somebody else. And so perhaps because of that, we could disagree. What we're going to show on this show, though, is that even in that situation, You can't agree to disagree. And let's explore that. And the reason why this question is so relevant is that we see too often in practice that people are disagreeing. And in fact, I would say, Jonathan, I don't know how you feel about it, but I think that we're seeing more disagreement today than we've ever seen before. And so a lot of people say, why don't we just agree to disagree? But what we want to point out in this episode is particularly in the context of business decision-making, that's a cop-out and it's not a smart strategy. It's not a cop-out, it's a mistake. Somebody is making a mistake. Now, let me just be very specific about this. What do we mean by a mistake? In a business decision, a well-run business, everybody has the same objectives. If you have, obviously, if you have different objectives, you might have different decisions. Different motivations to have different outcomes. But that's not, in a well-run business... Everybody has to have the same objective. So if everybody has the same objective, and I think the prime number example makes it clear, if you have the same information, you must come to the same decision. And so what we need to talk about in this situation is it's a very realistic assumption to say a good business, everybody has the same objective. I would say that's a definition of a well-run business. 
But it obviously is not a realistic assumption to say everybody in the organization has the same information. And it might seem obvious that if they have different information, they could come to different decisions. And so let's now think about the case when they have different information. And so the guest that we have on the show this time is Robert Alman, who has shown something quite astonishing. He has shown that even in the case when you don't have the same information, you cannot agree to disagree. It's an astonishing result. And the Nobel Prize Committee was so astonished by this result, they gave the Nobel Prize to Robert Alman partly for this insight. So let's talk about how you get that insight. So let's go back to the example of the prime numbers. Suppose that I come to you, Jonathan, and we have a discussion about whether a number is a prime number, and I know that you have a supercomputer and I don't. And we know also that I have the same objective to you and I'm not lying. Yes, all we're trying to do is figuring out whether the number is prime or not. Now, clearly, in this case, we're not going to have the same information because you ran the brute force approach where you checked all the divisors and I didn't. So if at the end of that conversation, we agree to disagree, clearly one of us is making a mistake. And I would say it is pretty obvious that if we agree to disagree in that case, I'm the one making the mistake because you have the supercomputer. Right. If I tell you the number's prime and I'm not lying and we have the same objectives, You have to say to yourself, I don't have a supercomputer. Jonathan does. Therefore, Jonathan's run that number and he knows it's prime, which means you know it's prime. So in the end, we will agree. And therefore, we will come to the same conclusion based on whether or not you tell me whether the number is prime, yes or no. And I could also tell you, I don't know. In which case, I'm telling you I haven't run it. And that means you also don't know. Or the third possibility is I say it's not prime. Then you know I've run it and I found out that the number is not a prime number, it has another divisor, and therefore you also know it. So either way, either we both know and we agree that it's not a prime number, either we both agree that we both don't know, or we all agree that the number is a prime number. Those are the only options we have. So for prime numbers, it's clear. Even if we have different information, we can't agree to disagree. But this is a pretty simple example. So let's think about a more complicated example where it's still going to be the case that you can't agree to disagree. All right, so let's explore this further in the context of a fun detective story. So a crime has been committed, and the DA would like to get it solved. He calls the heads of two investigative units and asks them to please report back with a culprit. Each head, who knows nothing about the case, appoints his best detective to the case. The detectives work completely independently and never communicate with each other. Now, importantly, both the detectives are both fully rationals. That is, they never make a mistake. They're equally skilled and have received exactly the same training in detective work. Detective A reports to his boss that the crime was most likely committed by Jules. And Detective B reports to his boss that the crime was most likely committed by Jonathan. They report nothing else to their respective bosses. After about 30 days in which the bosses did not communicate at all and learned nothing about the case other than the names of the culprits of their respective detectives, they meet in the DA's office and they both reveal the only information they know about the case, the identity of the perpetrator as reported to them. At this point, what will happen? Will they change their minds? The answer is that if they are fully rational, they must change their minds because they have the same information, which necessarily implies they must come to the same conclusion. In other words, let's just understand that. The only information they have is the culprit's name as reported by their detectives, which they've shared. So they do both have the same information. Obviously, one possibility is for them to now report that they simply don't know who committed the crime. Just as with the prime number example, it's either prime, not prime, or you don't know. In this case, it could be that Jonathan committed a crime, Jules committed a crime, or we simply don't know. I obviously think Jonathan did it. (laughs) Well, in exasperation, the DA asked both detectives to join them and explain the basis of their decision to the group. 
Because they do not have an infinite amount of time, the detective's explanation cannot cover every single detail of information they know. Once the detectives are done, they leave the room. At the end of this, will the group disagree in their recommendations? Well, it's the same as before. The group has the same information, so they cannot agree to disagree. Now, why is that? Well, before the detectives entered, everybody in the room agreed. Any information revealed by the detectives is common knowledge to everybody in the room. So the DA and the bosses must update the same way. They thus still share the same information, so they must still be in full agreement. Okay, now for Armin's insight. What about the two detectives? Can they agree to disagree? because they do not have the same information. Each detective knows all the information that was revealed in the discussion in the DA's office, as well as any private information that she did not reveal during the discussion. So if either detective does not agree with the group's decision, it must be because of something of relevance in her private information. Now, leaving aside the question of why the detective would not choose to reveal an important piece of information, Both detectives know that they are both fully rational. Both detectives know that neither detective makes a mistake. So if one detective discovers the other detective has a different person who committed the crime, then that detective knows that the other detective has an important piece of information. And because of that, he must change his mind. Now, given that this extra piece of information exists, each detective and the other members of the group will reason that if they had that information, their own mind would also change, since they know their minds work identically to the detectives because they're fully rational too. So the result is they cannot agree to disagree. It's just as if I have a supercomputer and I know the number's prime, you might not have a supercomputer, but you know, because I have a supercomputer, that therefore it must be the case that the number's prime. You don't even have to work it out. Now, importantly, this whole argument does not depend on what either detective chose to reveal during the group discussion. Indeed, both detectives could have kept completely silent. The conclusion remains the same. The entire group, including both detectives, can simply not agree to disagree. And this is an astonishing result. Basically, it says, I do not have to reveal all my information. All you need to know is that I don't make a mistake. And then we cannot agree to disagree. And the power of this insight means that if we're all sitting in a room making a business decision, if we're disagreeing, somebody in the room is making a mistake. And like I often tell my students, it could be you. Definitely. But now let's go back to what is probably the key assumption of underlying all of this. And that is that we both have the same objective. So let's think that through a little bit. What if there is the possibility that you have another objective than me? I'm not even sure that you do but I'm just suspicious that you have other objectives than me. How do I deal with that? Well, that is going to lead me... That the, 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 the insight that we have here will break down, right? If I have a different objective to you, then we could come to different conclusions without either one of us making a mistake. But what I would say is you're working for an organization that isn't optimal. Because in an organization... Everybody has to have the same objectives. So another way of saying it is, the mistake is, not everybody has the same objectives. So the organization should really work on setting the incentives better so that everybody's incentives are aligned to work towards the same objective. In fact, Jules, I would turn this around. I would say, if in a business meeting, we are disagreeing at the end of the meeting, then what we should all be thinking to ourselves is, what mistake are we making? Is the mistake that different people have different objectives? I want to be CEO and you want to be CEO and therefore we have different objectives? Or is it that somebody's truly making a mistake? They're weighing a piece of information too heavily or they're ignoring important information. It could be either. It's like a red flag. Something's wrong. Absolutely. And it's it's important to then dedicate resources to figuring out 
what exactly is going wrong and why. So at this point, I think it's time to introduce our guest, Robert Arman, who won the Nobel Prize in 2005, partly for this insight. Of course, the actual paper that won the Nobel Prize contains a formal mathematical proof that is much more subtle than our examples could possibly communicate. Welcome, Bob, to this show. Bob, let me start with a question I think is on many of our listeners' minds. Tell us how you had the insight. How did that work? Okay, very good question. Very good. Yeah, I was waiting for that question to come. (laughs) That's very interesting. Um, I'll tell you how it came about. There is a... In game theory, which is how I make a living, okay, <laughs> that's, that's my racket, like they say in America, yeah. okay. <laughs> uh, there is this concept of a mixed strategy. Now, what is a mixed strategy? It means when you have to decide whether to do A or B or C or D in a game, okay, in a an interactive decision situation where you are pushing one thing and somebody else is pushing something else, then it's, it may be important for you to not make a definite decision, but to mix your decisions. Because if you make a definite decision, let's take the game of uh, rock, scissors, paper. Okay, everybody knows how that is played. Now, so uh, rock beats scissors and scissors beats Paper and paper beats rock, okay? Uh, and so what should you do? Well, 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 the two players, one has to show a rock or a paper or a scissors, okay? And they have to do it simultaneously. Well, there's no good solution to that, okay? Because if, you, if I put scissors, then you'll put rock. Okay, so there's no right answer to this. So what you have to do is play at random, mix, mix the three, rock, scissors, paper, each one with one third probability. And that way, uh, the other side will not be able to sort of jump on you. Okay, you also do that. Okay, so the answer is sometimes you win, sometimes I win. All right. Now, so, so that, that, matter of mixing your strategies it becomes uh, central in game theory and you mix your strategies let's say in rock scissors paper you throw a die and uh, if it comes out one or two then you play rock and if you it comes out three or four you play scissors and if you come out five or six you play a uh, paper okay uh, now now those are objective probabilities, okay? And that that works fine. But then it occurred to me, and this is many years ago, it's like uh, 50 years ago, okay? It occurred to me that maybe you should do your mixing not on the basis of objective probabilities, like a a die coming out, but... uh, whether you think that uh, the next president will be Republican or Democratic, okay? And we can have different opinions about that. And maybe both of us can come out ahead. And I brought some examples where if we base our, our decisions on something which is not objective, but is subjective, where people could have different, legitimately different opinions, different probabilities, then uh, we, we both could get out ahead, maybe, okay? And I developed that. I developed that and I published a paper about it, okay? Uh, in fact, I published it in the first issue of the Journal of Mathematical Economics, which was, I think, in 1972, something like that. And then I started asking myself, hey, Bob, is that possible? Is it possible for people to hold different opinions as to the probability of the Republicans winning uh, the next election, okay? You and I hold different opinions, and we know about it? Is that possible? (laughs) And I started thinking about this, and I started thinking and thinking and thinking. 
And one afternoon, this was in Stanford University, one afternoon I uh, went to discuss this with Kenneth Arrow, who was perhaps the greatest uh, economist uh, of the uh, second half of the 20th century. Let's be careful, okay? Undoubtedly, the, 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 the greatest economy of the, of, of the second half of the 20th century. I went to, and he was sitting there in the office of Frank Hahn, who was also a great economist, both are no longer with us. And they were discussing, and I started uh, discussing this matter with them. And then suddenly I had a flash of intuition that said, Bob, this is impossible. You can't have different probabilities about, and, and I said that to them. And at that time, the, the, the concept of common knowledge was not known in the economic world either. In other words, what the, this business of I knowing, and, and I know that you know, and you know that I know, and so on and so forth. This wasn't, this was not a, uh, this was not known to the economic world. And I went back to my office and I thought about the thing for two or three days. And I came to the conclusion that if there's common knowledge of probab of different, that you can't have common knowledge of different probabilities. So the paper I wrote in the first issue of Journal of Mathematical Economics, at least that part of it, it was another part of it, but at least that part of it became empty, okay? <laughs> because you can't have that. Uh, but it grew out of that of the idea of subjective mixing of strategies. Subjective mixing. Well, you know what I really like about this story? Well, is that the story is about you changing your mind. Oh, absolutely. Which, of course, is exactly what it's about. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's it. That's it. And right now I'm working on another paper, okay, which takes off from a paper I wrote not 50 years ago like this one, but 25 years ago, Okay. <laughs> In 1995, I published this paper, and I'm saying, hey, no, it's all wrong. <laughs> not it's all wrong, but there's a better way of doing this. Okay, no. What I published is not wrong, but there's a better way of doing it. Uh, right, so that is exactly uh, right. And, and that is how that came about. Uh, and I remember sitting in the office of Arrow, of Hahn, Frank Hahn. Arrow, Arrow liked to go about to other people's offices. He was a great man. He liked to go about to other people's offices, okay, and talk to them. And uh, I went back to my office and I had this insight. And then I thought, hey, this is pretty simple, Bob. Okay, I said to myself, this is not really worth publishing. And I went back to Arrow. <laughs> And I said, Arrow, it's uh, Kenneth, it's this way. And he said, oh, my God, this is terrific. I said, no, no, this is, <laughs> it's, uh, should I publish this? He said, of course you should publish it. Uh, and it's a very short paper. It's, uh, what is it, one, two, three, three pages long, three and a half pages long, something like that. Very, very short paper. And it's, I have two papers like that, which are very widely cited. And this is one of them. So that's how that came about. That's the story of the Genesis. Thanks a lot, Bob. What a great story that is. So re related to that, I had a, a question for you that I want to ask you. Why do you think that people disagree so much, particularly since in the modern world, we all have access to vast amounts of data? And surely based on your insights, wouldn't we have predicted that as access to data went up, disagreement between people should have gone down, yet it seems like we've seen the opposite. Do you have an idea of why that is? Uh, I think so. Okay, yes. Uh, I think people uh, disagree because uh, they are striving to different goals, okay? Many, many times, many, many times, people are striving to different goals, and that is the source of disagreement. People uh, see facts differently, okay? They look at the world differently. And I think the phenomenon 
that you have brought up and that the more data there is, the more disagreement there is, yes, that phenomenon uh, could be because people find in the data, in all this data, they find uh, items that uh, accord with their view, okay? And they uh, naturally uh, latch on to those items that accord with their view. And the more, the more data there is in general, the more items there are that accord with your view and the more items that are, are there accord with my view, okay? So, uh, uh, so it may make for a even more disagreement. All right, I have one last question for you, very short question that comes back to what you said earlier. And I'm just curious how you think about it. You said we're born, we have, you know, there's nothing to have a view of the world on, so there's no in impression yet. Then everybody goes through different experiences, and that's really what determines your probability distribution at that point in time. But right now there is a discussion going on wherein people are claiming that certain information cannot be exchanged. Right, what some people call the lived experience. Do you believe that there is information that can never be exchanged between people? Do you believe that such a thing exists? Or do you think that people should just try harder? Well, you know, let, let me point this out. We're not talking about exchanging information. And that, that, that is essential to realize that, okay? We're not talking about exchanging information. We're only talking about exchanging my probability estimate for a certain event happening and your probability estimate. So I say, I say, I say to you, my probability is, I think that this will happen. Uh, let's say uh, Biden will be reelected. <laughs> Don't take this uh, personally, uh, but just I, I want to make it realistic. Biden will be reelected with probability uh, one quarter. Okay, I, I give it. I give it one quarter, and you say, hey, "Bob, that's crazy." I mean, he's he's doing a great job. Uh, people will be convinced of this. I give him ninety percent. So I say, uh, well, you don't know the facts. I hold on to one quarter. And you say, uh, well, maybe. So, okay, I'll bring it down to 80%, okay? We're just exchanging probabilities. And it's only and the, at the end, it has to be, if we, if at, at the point where we say, it cannot be common knowledge between us that you, and you're always updating because you think that when I say one quarter, I must know something on the, which that is based. And when I say, when I look at your 90%, I say, well, that is, must be based on something. So I, I readjust, but I, it never becomes uh, explicit what that something is, it doesn't become explicit, okay? So we're not exchanging information. We're only exchanging the probabilities, okay? So even if that is possible, that there are certain information that cannot be exchanged, okay? But you are basing your probability estimate on that, okay? Then it doesn't matter that you can't give me that information. Because I say your probability estimate, and I give full um, faith and confidence in you're not making some kind of mistake, then I say, okay, you are on your information, which you can't give me, even if you wanted to, you can't give. But on that, it's based on my information. Maybe I can't give you. OK, but still, we have to reach the same conclusion. It's just like the two detectives. All they needed to do was report the culprits. They did not have to share their private information. OK, Bob. I don't. I, I feel bad for how long we've kept you. Um, Thank you so much. This has been really interesting. It was great to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jules. That was so interesting. It was so interesting how he had that idea. Yeah, and you know what I really liked the most about the interview is the deeper lesson that it had. Can you imagine really what he said? He said because I was willing to admit that I made a mistake, 
And I don't know whether you noticed it too, but it was almost that he was giddy about the fact that he had done something wrong, that he had made a mistake. And by fixing that mistake, the payoff of admitting that he made a mistake and fixing it was winning a Nobel Prize. Now, how much better does it get than that? I think that's an amazing life lesson. You know, you can use what we're talking about today as a diagnostic tool. Think of all the disagreements you've had when you've been in meetings. In every one of those cases, somebody was making a mistake. Yeah, just think about all the hiring decisions that people make. I mean, how often do people leave the room still disagreeing? I mean, particularly in our profession, I think I've, I've noticed this many times. You know, one of the things to remember is when people disagree, you know that somebody's making a mistake. That's not the same thing as saying that somebody else is correct. It could be the case that everybody in the room is making a mistake. No, and, and that's what we saw in the example of the detectives, right? We had the two detectives, but it could be that both people were innocent, right? It could be that both detectives were wrong, right? The only thing we knew was that at least one person was making a mistake. Now, Jonathan, another thing that, that came up several times and that I, I want to have your opinion on is it seems to me, I don't know whether you agree, but it seems to me that disagreement has increased in the world. And I had would have predicted that given all the data that we have, if you and I have a disagreement, all we have to do is go to the web, look up what the fact is, and then we're done with it. And for some reason, it hasn't worked out that way. Now, why do you think that is? You know, I agree with Alman. I think it's that people have different goals and they suffer from what psychologists call the confirmation bias. That is, people naturally look for confirming evidence and ignore contradictory evidence. No, and I like those arguments, but the thing that I'm worried about most is this, right? It is about what you can attribute to the other person. Think about the political situation that we have in many places in the world today, right? There are two reasons by which you can just try to disqualify the other person and thereby not having to learn from what they have to say and update your beliefs. And the first one is just to say, it's the other person making the mistake. It's not me, so I don't have to reconsider my position. The other one, which I think is even nastier in some sense, is that you just attribute bad intentions and, to the other person, meaning our goals are not the same, but it's not just even that it's not the same goal. I just say that the other person is a bad person and therefore I don't have to update. And then people are off the hook because we both know that learning or what we call in statistics Bayesian updating is very difficult. It's a painful process. But now people have these two excuses to not have to do it. That, that worries me. You know, I agree, Jules. You know, the basic insight here is if there's disagreement in the room, it means somebody's making a mistake. And you can just let yourself off the hook by saying, I'm not the person making a mistake, it's the other person. And you're off the hook. And I think that's a big mistake people make in business. They let themselves off the hook too easily. You know, if you think about it, this is a think about it in a, in a very important decision that we've been dealing with in the last two years, which is how to respond to COVID. I mean, basically every county in America had a different approach. They can't all be right. Yes, somebody must have been making a mistake. Or more than or all of them. <laughs> exactly. Well, Jonathan, I think that was a great episode. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the next one too, let me tell you. I mean, in the next episode, we are going to be speaking with Larry Summers on what I think is a very important question, which is, uh, should we tax corporations? What is the rationale for the corporate income tax? Uh, I think it's going to be a lively discussion. Thanks for listening to the All Else Equal podcast. Please leave us a review at Apple Podcasts. We love to hear from our listeners. And be sure to catch our next episode by subscribing or following our show wherever you listen to your podcasts. For more information and episodes, visit allelseequalpodcast.com or follow us on LinkedIn. The All Else Equal podcast is a joint venture of Stanford University's Graduate School of Business and the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and is produced by Podium Podcast Co.